you can't do it. You're not good enough. You're in the wrong trade. You're going to be poor all your life. I could never figure out why I was always rubbish at certain things. Whether it was doing well at school or just never being able to fit in. Growing up for me was not easy as I mean, where did I fit in? I was not the smartest person so I knew higher education was not for me. Any time I had an idea, I already set myself up for failure. Do you ever feel like your life is just stopped and time is passing by? And the only thing to you is you're a pawn in the game of life who's been forgotten about while the world carries on and you feel like nothingness is the only thing you have to look forward to. They say everybody dies, but not everybody lives. Some people don't believe in second chances, but as a young man here living in Birmingham, I have to say second chances are real as long as you want that change, as long as it's true to who you are and who you want to become. When I was 19, I found out I was going to be a father and that lots of criticism was put towards me. When I was 20, I became a single father. And it's only then you realise how tough times can really get. People generally look down at you. Being a single parent, you, uh, you try your best for your child, but to them, it's never enough. No matter how hard you try, to people that are looking down at you for being a single parent, it's never enough. At this point in my life, I gave myself an ultimatum. You can either get up and work to provide for yourself and your son, or you can let life consume you and your child. The one thing I noticed is how expendable you are to people. It seems the people who, with nothing, are easy targets to get used, abused, pushed aside, laughed at, because to the people who are living comfortably, why would I matter to them? Why would my son matter to them? I started working as a mechanic for my father, as I always helped him over weekends, part time, doing what I can. My love for cars never died, I've always worked on them, messed around with them. It was the only ever, the one thing I was ever really good at, no matter how many times people told me I wasn't. I stuck to it because I had a love, I had a passion for it, I just, I just wanted to do it, it was in my veins to do it, it was in my blood. A few years after, while sitting in my friend's house, I decided again, yep, another ultimatum. Either chase my dreams or continue as I was. Life was good but I knew I had to try and make it better. We sat down and drafted the design for Autofit Birmingham and since then I've never ever looked back. We had success online with so much more for me to do I still pushed on. I started to go into car reviews and making our own adverts and I gained thousands of views. People actually like what I was doing. This guy who his whole life people told him that he was in the wrong trade or whatever. People actually like my work, like genuine people actually like my work. From then, I started making our own adverts and doing car reviews. And once people started to like my work, I already knew success was imminent. I started to believe in myself more and more. When people ask me what I do for a living, although I'm not the richest or the most successful person in the world, I keep my head up high and I say, I'm a businessman, I'm an entrepreneur, I'm a presenter on my own channel, but above all, I'm most proud of being a single father. Over the time that's passed, I feel closer to God. I feel at peace with my maker, but I also feel at peace with myself. And I think that's a very important thing that we need to do, be at peace with ourselves. I finally feel like I'm heading in the right direction for my son's sake, for my own sake, and for my family's sake. I really do feel blessed. My message to anybody young if you work hard, if you're persistent in what you do and believe in yourself, you will be successful. There is no doubt about it, especially if it's in your heart to do good things as well. You will be successful no matter what's put in front of you. If there's somebody puts up a brick wall in front of you, run right through it. Then nobody can stop you, especially if your maker's with you. Nobody on this earth can stop you if you've got it inside you to succeed. I found help in my faith, in my love for my son. You will succeed if it's what you truly want. Be kind to others, help those people in need, and above all, live a good life yourself. People often get confused with what they think about making it in life is. For me, I don't need 10 Lamborghinis and a mansion and a yacht. I've made it because I appreciate the most important things in life. I get to come home to my son and my family every day and spend time with the people I love. It really doesn't get much better. Yeah, money and possessions are nice, but just think, when we are gone, we would, good, we would give everything just to spend one more second with a with loved one, with our children. We'd give up everything just to, just to see them again. 
it just makes you realize how important things are in life like i said i could i get to come home be with my son have a kick about have a cup of tea with a chocolate digestive biscuit to me i've made it everything else around me is a bonus so i guess to conclude you should be thankful for the people you have in your life money comes and goes but the people you love if they go you can't replace them they're gone forever so every second you're with that person whom you love whether it be your children your wife your girlfriend your mom your dad brother sister whoever it is your grandparents somebody you love and you care for you know and they they feel the same for you spend that time with them because time no matter how many trillions you've got in the bank you can't buy it and you can't buy that person back once they're gone appreciate what's actually worth appreciating not things like cars and stuff like that you know we leave them sitting outside in the rain you know but with the person we bring them in the house we look after them we, we do our best by them if you're not talking to a loved one or a friend over something trivial and small pick up the phone get on the blower and make amends life is too short and life is too sweet to be wasted once you get that mix right of life life is so sweet it's unbelievable you realize every second is and every day every minute every hour is a blessing be you get to do what you want and if you're doing good things for others that is an it's just an amazing feeling there's no point of earning lots of money if you're not going to do if you're not going to help those people that really need it like how how can you you know how would you feel in yourself that you're making that much money but yet you're not giving to you know there's a family who've got children who are missing meals and stuff like that you know it like it literally it hurts me to think of that it it hurts me to think when i read in articles in the guardian i read an article about this um this guy was from a school i'm not going to mention the school's name it was in a deprived area not in birmingham and um they they were planning on cutting the free school meals and this teacher had written in the article that that free school meal was probably the best meal of the day for some of these children I would always try to do something to kind of help children who are, who need the basic thing of food you know so if there's any charities that want to get involved with me you know like i said we ain't the richest people in the world but we will try our best to help because it's something that we need to do before i go um everybody's always doing these silly challenges the kiki challenge or whatever you're doing um i like to give you a challenge i challenge you to be kind to others to forgive more to love forever and if you're lucky enough to have your children with you and to have your your wife with you your girlfriend whatever your loved ones with you especially your children then you should know how i feel deep down i hope these messages in this in these videos from all the people that have participated go far and wide and if one person decides to change their ways for the better then humanity can still live within all of us we can all live in a better world i'm not saying it's going to be perfect because some people don't want to change and some people they'd rather feel as though they're more superior than others but at the end of the day we're all either going to be put into the ground or we're going to be cremated or whatever it is whatever your beliefs are we're all going to go back to our maker and one day he's going to say what did you do with your life did you ever help those people that asked for your help did you ever do good in your community did you ever did you ever feed somebody poor you know you were too busy making money and driving nice cars and wearing big 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 chains and all the rest of it but what about the things that really matter in this day and age we shouldn't have it where people are starving but unfortunately we do so if you could do something about it you know do it with that i just like to say like i said before if we can all just do something something kind something small anything you know then humanity can still live on within all of us so that's my story let's get on to the next one so i'm here at my friend's restaurant the cave in cape hill and i'm here to meet a guy called sean let's go hear his story Hello mate, how you doing? I'm good, thank nice you. Nice to see you again. Yeah, always, always. Um, this is my friend Nabil here at the Cave Restaurant. If you ever want to pop down, the food, the food here is absolutely gorgeous. Come see Nabil, he's a really nice guy and he'll look after you. Thank you. Right Sean, you know what we're doing. What's your story? All right, well, as you've already heard, my name's Sean. 
Um, I mean, my story isn't, you know, it's nothing major, it's nothing really bad, it's nothing really great. Grew up in a general area. Um, I'm not going to say it was the roughest area, but at the same time, you know, as you can imagine, like any estate, you've got your good people, you've got your bad people. Um, growing up was all right, man. Like, had a few situations when I was younger. Um, I was on a bit of a bad track when I was your a uh, bit bad path when I was younger, simply because when I was 14, I almost got stabbed, and that was by someone I actually knew. Uh, he was taking, I'm not, I'm not exactly sure what it was. I think it was either coke or pills. Um, but yeah, it was a guy who I actually knew and he was gonna stab me. So once that happened, I kind of got into a situation where I was kind of like, I'm never gonna let myself be in that position again because it was, it was quite a, a scary experience for me. That meant that I started carrying a knife at one point in my life, um, just because I wanted to kind of protect myself. It wasn't a thing where I ever wanted to go out and stab anybody. I was just fearful for my, fearful for my own life. So um, that became a thing. Um, it became a thing where I was rolling around and um, I, I always had it around me. Um, and you know, I, I'm not proud of that. I'm not proud of the fact that that happened or anything like that, but it's just one of those things that does happen you know for people in life then um i used to start i started getting into a bit of a situation where there was a lot of a lot of hassle going on and i wouldn't say it was because of the people i was hanging around with or anything like that i think it's just a literally a thing that happens you get a lot of males young males with like testosterone and stuff like that and you know a lot of egos and things like that so you know stupid things was happening over the smallest of reasons so um you know there was a point where i was getting into a bit of fights here and there and stuff like that again i was never using knife because i'd only ever i'd only ever want to use that if i felt threatened that i was going to lose my own life so i was never just like pulling out a knife or anything like that you know it was never anything like that but yeah i got into a few scraps and things and um a few scuffles um i'll just quickly show you this here um, I almost lost my hand at one point, um, I was in hospital, had to go into emergency surgery, I broke the tendons in my hand, so I almost actually had to have my hand um, amputated because I didn't want to go to the hospital originally because of the trouble that I was in of what caused it and so um, because of that I got to a point where you know my mom just gave me an ultimatum and she just said listen you know you either sort yourself out or you're gonna have to just kind of do this thing on your own because she she didn't want to be worrying about me every night about whether I'm gonna be in hospital or if I'm gonna be dead or whatever do you know what I mean that kind of thing and you know once my mom had said that to me I finally just made the decision to just try and you know keep myself on, on, on a better path and Again, it's not to say that I was purposely going down that path originally, but at the same time, I wasn't exactly trying to fight it, if you know what I mean. Um, I was kind of just, you know, whatever happens, happens, I'm ready, that, that kind of mentality. Whereas, you know, once I'd kind of had that, uh, that talk from my mum, it was a situation where I just felt, I'm gonna actually do my best now to keep my nose clean and stay out of trouble and, you know, just, just be the bigger man in situations. So after that, you know, I stopped carrying a knife or anything like that, so thank God that I never actually, you know, I never actually used it or anything like that. Nothing ever actually happened. And uh, yeah, you know, now I work in a bank. I've got a good career, you know, I actually work in a decent position. And um, I would like to have turned my life around for the better. So, what motivates you then, and to stay away from that life and keep doing what you're doing? Um, I've seen a lot of people. Um, go down that path and I've seen where it, what it leads to um, you know I've seen people go to jail I've seen people killed you know what I mean it, uh, it's just what's the point you know what I mean like when, when it's all said and done what have you got to show for it you know um, it's, it's, it's a thing where like this five minutes of your pride and your ego for that five minutes of you feeling like the big man can cost you the whole of your life behind bars and it's you know what what have you actually got to show for it in the end you know what i mean who cares that you did this or you stood up for yourself you know what i mean it's, there's just there's, there's, there's nothing there's no real end goal for it do you know what i mean and you know, while people may not look at my life now and say, oh, you're a superstar or anything like that, I'm not in prison. <laughs> and you know what I mean? I'm not in prison, I'm not dead or anything like that. And for me, that's, 
I'm okay with that. That for me is enough motivation for me to feel that I'm doing something right because you know I know a lot of people who aren't in my position. So you know, for me, my motivation is just trying to live, really, just trying to live my life and then you know experience as much of it as possible, and not throw it away over over stupidness. What would your message be to anybody young right now carrying a knife? What would your message be to them? Just think about the end goal, like because. It's, it's, I understand, so you know, I'd be a hypocrite now to turn around and say, you know, why are you doing it, etc. I've done it myself, so I'd be, a, I'd be a big hypocrite to turn around and say to people, you know, you shouldn't, uh, you shouldn't be scared or anything like that. It's a, it's a scary time that we are living in. Like people are getting killed left, right, and centre. People are getting stabbed and everything. So I, I can't, I can't say that I don't understand where you're coming from. But all I say is think of the end the end goal that's what it's all about like you carry a knife something happens you kill someone and then you go to jail or you end up getting killed because these other people come and retaliate and come and kill you like what what's you know what i mean like what what's what what what, what really have you got to show for it at the end of it do you know what i mean like at the end of the day if you try and keep you keep yourself out of these situations and just do your best to avoid any types of conflict then you know you can actually just try and just try and live your life do you know what i mean just try and avoid those situations and again i can't make promises that that's going to be enough you know innocent people get killed all the time but you know that you're doing your best to stay out of it do you know what i mean and that's that should be enough for you to feel comfortable that you know you're not going to be as likely to end up in that stuff because when you're carrying it around and you feel confident and then you can antagonize the situation so like like for example if, if you've got a knife and somebody else has got a knife you feel confident because you've got the knife as well so what could have been an easy like look i don't want no trouble whatever whatever and that's enough you can go might turn into a you get cocky and you start pulling out your knife today they pull out their knife and then it becomes a thing so you know what i mean like sometimes just your actions can fuel something to be a lot worse than it than it actually needs to be do you know what i mean so you know just think about think about the end game think about the end of the situation and this is just one other thing like i've never killed anyone so i can't imagine how it feels but I can imagine it's not going to be something that you're going to feel great about afterwards. You know what I mean? Like, you might feel big for, for a few seconds, but once you actually realise you took someone's life, I, I don't think that's going to be anything you're going to feel proud about or good about at all. So, you know, there's these things that you got to... Can you live with that on your conscience as well? Do you know what I mean? Can you live with that in your head? Just to wrap this up, where do you see yourself in the next 10 years? Alive. <laughs> not in prison. <laughs> um, I mean... Who knows what the future holds, do you know what I mean? But the main thing is is that I I'm trying my best to keep out of trouble, do you know what I mean? Like I I just use little things that I have um, that that would have angered me before to turn it into something a bit more productive, like going to the gym, do you know what I mean? For me, the anger that I have, I can go and just train it out, you know what I mean? I can get out of any frustrations that I have and for me that's a really, a really good tool. Um, a really good mechanism for utilizing any kind of frustrations that I get or emotional anger or anything, do you know what I mean? So like, like whatever it is that you like, you find that you might have a passion for, something that you might enjoy doing, like utilize that, like use your frustrations to be creative and actually, because then you actually get something out of it, do you know what I mean? Like you could like be, I don't know, an actor or, you know, an artist or whatever, like you're angry, write about it or try and do, do a film about it, do you know what I mean? You're actually being creative then and then that's going to show people more when you can actually create a piece of art or you know just anything like when you can put it to something productive it's going to be able to be used a lot more beneficial than actually going out and using it on somebody else do you know what i mean so if you want to try and get your message across and whatnot do it in a productive way you know what i mean you ain't got to go out trying to trying to kill people then or anything like that you know Right mate, it's been an absolute pleasure Very to, uh, online, to meet you. Thank you for sharing your story. No and I hope, it's I hope it makes some use for people, man. I hope if you are seeing it Definitely. that, you know, you take it in and if it, if it helps someone, then, you know, it's it's still the right thing. 100% know. mate. I'm glad you're on the right path now. Good luck, mate. Appreciate Good luck it. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Right, I'm here with my friend Ramon, who's also volunteered to share his story. Let's have a listen. Hi there, my name's Ramon Reed and I'm currently a trainee solicitor and a student of law. I'm from 
I'm originally from Hockley and Handsworth, two areas which people perceive to be, you know, rough areas. From these areas, I've um, seen people who have been victims of knife and gun crime. I've had many opportunities to join gangs, but I've just never felt like that was the way for me. Um, I've always wanted to be an inspiration in my community and I've always wanted to see more than just gangs and a ghetto lifestyle. You know, I'm a training solicitor. You know, I want to be a solicitor so I can help people in my community. And what made you want to get into that? You know, I've just seen too many people go jail and I've seen, you know, like people that I've cared about go jail and people who are genuinely good people, but they've just made a few mistakes and I've always wanted to, you know, help them like, up to, like from the legal from the legal point of things you know as a mean? young man in your community have you ever had an opportunity to join a gang i've had many really yeah i've had like there's many gangs in my area actually and what's it been like staying away from the gangs i mean what's your life like today well you know the, the, uh, the gang lifestyle hasn't affected me it's affected me like from the third third person point of view not not personally because i've always tried to avoid it you know what i mean but there's been times where I've nearly encountered it, but I've just always thought of, of the possible outcome of joining the gang, which is, you know, life imprisonment and possibly being killed. So what motivates you every day then to get up, go, you know, go to do your job, to study, you said you were studying as yeah. well? You know, it's more for other people than myself, really. As a solicitor and, a, you know, as a lawyer, the, the help of the people, you know what I mean? I always want to help other people and I always put other people before myself. And that's always a good trait to have. Yeah. So where do you see yourself in the next five to ten years? Five to ten years, definitely qualifying. Yeah. And um, you know, helping my community, that's all I want. And what would your message be to other young people who are maybe studying in law like yourself or just trying to get a normal day to day job and just trying to stay away from gang life? What would your message be to them? Don't slip off. Because if you slip off, and um, get a criminal record, you could mess up your whole career. Yeah. You could mess up everything. So what are your plans now once you once you get once you reach the law bar, where yeah. would you where would you like to be? What what do you want to do? Would you stay in your own community? Help yeah, I'd, I'd definitely stay in my own community. Yeah. Yeah, and just help out my family, help out my peers and help out everybody. I mean, it's nice to meet a young individual like yourself sure. that wants to do something with your life because you. you know life is a precious gift and we should all grasp it and no matter how many times somebody says you can't do something you can you know believe in yourself because a lot of the time you see all these things where people are doing stuff to please other people but if you know if you're religious you should do what you do to you know to please God also please yourself because you should be important when you gain that love for yourself mm. you can conquer anything true because at the end of the day we're all humans and we're all, we've all got opportunity true. and it's nice to see a young man like yourself take it thank you so it's been a pleasure doing this interview with you, mate. I wish you all the best. Cheers, man. Thank you very much. So I'm here to see Mike, my barber at Smarkers Barbers. Another gentleman had changed his life, a second chance. Now we're doing good things for people in this local community. Keeping people just like me, looking trim and fresh. Let's go hear Mike's story. So, obviously Mike, I know who you are, because you trim me all the time, but do you want to explain to everyone who you are? Yeah, I'm, I'm Mike, Mike the Barber, Smart Cox Barber Shop, one of the best barber shops in Brom. Yeah. How long have you been trimming for, Mike? Um, the last, a couple of years now, but um, I've got serious about barbering the start of this year, so... Yeah, the start of the year, I've got really serious about barbering. And what made you get into barbering? Um, well, before barbering, I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do with my life. And it just came across to me, barbering. Because it, barbering is an art as well. And I thought, you know what, let me just try it out. So um, I was working, I was doing warehouse work. Um, I found a course evening courses from like six to nine twice a week i've done it for a year got my level two stuck it out and here i am now yeah 
It's not always been about barbering and earning a living, has it? No, it hasn't always been barbering. Um, it was quite a negative past, to be honest. What um, do you mean by negative past? I had to find my way, like, um, it was a lot of street life, crime, petty stuff, serious stuff, um, going to jail, doing serious time. But you live and you learn. Um, I think a lot of us do need to go through things to make us change, you know, to find your avenue. But I say I'm one of the lucky ones because some people, they travel down the hard road and there's no, there's no way out. You know, you've gone too far. You're either too far in the gang stuff or um, you end up doing 30 years, 20 years in, you know, prison. It's no life. So what's your motivation then? Get up in the morning, go to work. What gives you that drive to get out of bed? Uh, my motivation, first you got to have it for yourself anyway, but really it's from um, my kids. I've got six kids and a lovely missus, I'm blessed. Um, so everything I do is for my family. Um, yeah, so that's my drive. And what would your message be to other young people who are maybe wanting to get into barbering or just try and change their life? Um, you know what, barbering's a good trade, it's a good thing to have. But um, I think, number one, like, if you do something, you have to be passionate about it, you know, because you, I don't know, like, the way I see it, if you, no matter what career you choose to do, if you're not really passionate about it, if you're just doing it for the sake of it, I don't think it's going to last. You have to, I don't know, it's okay trying something, and if it works, yeah, yeah, but how can I explain it? Um, all right, like I said, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. I fought barbering, yeah, then I started to do it, then I got good at it, I stuck to it, I liked it. You have to like what you're doing, you have to enjoy it or, you, or you're going to derail, you're not going to stick to it, basically. And what would your message be? If you, say if you could change one thing from your past, what would you change? Um, I mean, did you have some question. negative influences or...? I did. Um, peer pressure was a big thing as well. Um, and I think... I think it took me a long time to be myself. Like, okay, I always knew who I was, um, but I think for a while I was afraid to be myself. Like, you know, surroundings, feeling that you have to live up to a, a certain expectation, areas that you're around, um, friends you're around. But you have to think like what you want for yourself and the people that are around you, like, what do they want from you? Like. Are they positive influence? So, yeah, peer pressure is a big thing. It's a big thing. Mm -hmm. Now that you've turned your life around, where do you want to be in the next 10 years? Next 10 years, I want to be one of the best barbers. I want to be one of the best. Um, I want to have barber shops everywhere. I want to train people up. Um, sky's the limit, man. Um, I haven't really thought of everything where exactly I want to be, but everything what I'm doing now, I just want to perfect it be better, um, own my house. I don't want my kids to have to like struggle for anything. You know, it starts at home, innit? So I've got a big household, so I have to support everybody. So. And I know we always talking about, we always talking about feeling, you know, comfortable and where we are and what we're doing. But mm. what makes you the most happiest now that you've turned your life around and you're, you had a second chance at life and you took it? Um, what makes me happy is just actually finding, like waking up knowing that I'm going to work and this is what I want to do, like barbering is what I want to do. Um, I'm surrounded by good people every day, family, um, close friends. Um, yeah, you, ha you have to be, you have to have a positive surrounding and, you know, that good energy, that's what you need around you. If you ain't got it around you, you need to move from it, you ain't gonna, you're not going to grow. Or people around you who, don't what don't want what like I don't know like you have to be on the same kind of level you know you'll be able to bounce off each other mm. so gonna let everyone know where you are what you're doing and who you're working with yeah um well I'm at Smart Cuts Barbershop 138 Sandon Road Bearwood um you can catch us well you can book www.smartcutsuperz.co.uk they're very straightforward. Uh, we're nice, friendly people. 
we speak about everything in the shop as well. Um, there's a lot of banter. Everything, it's, it, it, it's therapy as well. It's more than a haircut. What you say in the shop stays in the shop. It stays in that's the, the shop. One, yeah, that's the code. <laughs> that's the code. That's the code. It stays in the shop. Right. So yeah. So I can vouch for this man. This man <laughs> cuts me more than anybody. You know, he's, the trim that this man gives me, unbelievable. If you ever look at me and think, yo, where do you get his trim from? I am in here, I'm trimming. If you ever want to pop in and say hello to me, say hello to Mike. Yeah. Come and see him, you can come and see Nigel as well, do the barber mm -hmm. here. Mate, I vouch for him. He's the best barber I've ever had. He's doing well, just like me. Everybody deserves a second chance. Yeah. And if you can do well, well. Also, big shout out to Nigel as well. Bad boy barber. Can we get Bad the, boy barber. Can we get in the camera? Good friend. No. Wicked mentor. Get in the camera. <laughs> so, uh, I'm so, just bigging it up. Sir, yeah? I could never choose who the best yes, barber was, so I'm just going to say they're both as brilliant as, e as each other. My virgin Nigel. Yeah, the doctor. <laughs> yeah. Good friend. Wicked barber. My mentor. Positive energy. Definitely. Yeah. A you know what to catch us. Just happy people. Yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. Positive energy. Yeah. Come and get a trim. Be relieved when you walk back through the door. And, and, and on top of that, you're looking sharp as well. I vouch yeah. for these people, the really, really nice people. Come down, get a trim, say hello. It's more than just a haircut, it's a lifestyle, it's therapy. So, I'm here today to meet my good friend and my neighbour, Mick Riley, who uh, has been there, done that, got many stories to share. So, uh, let's, get, let's uh, have a listen. Right, mate. Hello. How you doing, UK? Very well, thank you. Nice to see you, mate. Welcome to my man cave. It's, it's uh, nice to be here, mate. A bit untidy, but uh, there you go. There's me burner. Mick, I know you've had a lot of life experiences. I'm always <laughs> listening to your stories and always fascinated. <laughs> very, so. very much so. So, and I know you've always had a lot of ups and downs. Yes, I certainly so have. Yeah. Well, uh, basically, uh, if I get back to my childhood, um, I must say that I had a beautiful childhood, uh, down to my father because he got such a sense of humour. Uh, he's the only person I know that nearly killed my mother through laughing um, <laughs> because at Christmas time, it was a kid, it was beautiful to see um, them laughing as parents. And he was always telling jokes. And um, the one Christmas, he, he, they was in the kitchen and he told her something funny. And she got a toffee in her mouth and bang, she went down. And I mean, there was no first aid courses then, and we all panicked and tapped, and you know, she was in a terrible state. And uh, finally got it, and she, you know, they're sucking for air. <laughs> she had no granddad of <laughs> old pills and all this. But anyway, um, so we, we, we got around, and then she said, Don't ever tell me any more jokes. And we went down the outdoor, there was an outdoor down the road, and got some bottles of, of beer, like to celebrate she was still alive. It, uh, my father always took us on holiday, and um, he'd come out, he used to work at the carriage works. And he'd come home and he'd put his wages, say, right, this is what we got for our holiday. And our mum used to have a pin out, she used to save money in there, and say, no, we ain't, and she'd count it out. We used to go to Wales, and it was like back in the days when there's sheep running around the caravans and that. And it was great to get up to the sea and all the rest of it. So really, like, uh, it was a great uh, lifestyle uh, for the youngster to see the happiness and the singing and that uh, that went on. And then it don't happen there. I mean, there was pianos then, and everybody in the room sang the, even the cat from next door done his bit, he could sing. But now, as I say, I've got grand memories of that. And it was also when we left school, you could get a job anywhere. I got a job in the uh, bakery, Scribbins as it was, and um, that was good. Uh, you know, the money was rubbish, Lord, but uh, it was just good times. And it was well, at the bakery, uh, I had a good mate, Ronnie Tanner, well, I'll say his name, and he was on the one ovens and I was on the other ovens. And he was a good dancer. And um, the one morning he said to me, we had to light the ovens up and so forth. And he said to me, um, how's your dancing going, Skip? That was your nickname. I said, oh, not very good in the corners. I said, I keep getting trapped in the corners. He said, well, when we go over to check the ovens, he said, I'll, I'll have a look. He said, I'll take the, what was it? The man's, the woman's steps and you can do the man, the man's steps. I said, okay. So you can imagine the lighting, there was all flower bags around the ovens. And then we went over there, white ovals and white hats. So he says, come on, let's see where the problem is. So we danced around and he got me in a corner. We had to do this thing. He was teaching me the pendulum. We had to do this pendulum and you come out the corner. Trapped down like that, like, anyway. About 10 o'clock, I was called into the offices. 
the manager and the superintendent says, uh, Michael, we think you and Ronnie have been working together too, too long. Uh, we've seen you both dancing this morning around the flower bags. I said, whoa, stop, stop. And I, I used to red from my neck to my forehead like I used to blush. I said, look, I said, we're just good mates. They said, we understand that, but that's why we've got to separate you. And as I said, there was lots of things come from it, like, you know, that, you know, that, that was happy days. You was, you know, there was lots of fun went on there. And uh, I had a mate there, Roy Ingram, that used to follow Muhammad Ali, and I used to spar with him. I used to be Sonny Liston. And when I think back now, uh, I mean, the money was rubbish, but there was happy times, you know, and you just move on. And then I had a relation, Paddy O'Reilly, over the road. You used to run a boxing club. And, of course, when you're young, you don't think, anything that ever was going to happen to you ever going to be bad or anything and he used to say to the young lads in the boxing it's good for you because you've got to learn to take the knocks and and get up and stand up and carry on again and in later in life it, it come to me that did it in the sense that uh, I uh, I was working at Land Rover 94 it was and I started having problems like where little cuts wouldn't heal up and pains that you, know, you didn't want them went for checkups anyway I was told I got leukemia and I mean, it's the biggest shock you can ever come under. So I had me, um, what was it, two, two, 12 months a period of chemotherapy. And what's that like, Nick? It's It was terrible. At the time, I'd, I'd got, I'd be a lot better now, but it was a sickness that went with it. I mean, it was done to intravenous, like, and, yeah. you know, it's like a cold feeling going through you. But it was after, it, it, you got this sickness and um, kind of, on the hour, you, you got sick. Seven, I could, used to count it seven times. And I remember the one time I used to get, take a bowl into the room to get out of the way, but I got sick. But I missed the bowl and he hit the carpet. And when I ran in to get something to clean it up, when I got back, it had burnt a complete hole in the carpet. That was just your, your own boil. Because uh, I've been sick that many times, that there was only boil left. And that's what it's there for to break down your food. And, and that's why these young girls that do this slimming problem because they're getting sick, it's, it, it rots the teeth and everything, so it was a learning curve. But so I got over that, and um, you have to, and I went back to work, and um, and Land Rover was, abs oh, I worked at Land Rover, that was absolutely marvellous. When I went back to work, they put somebody with me, and I didn't have to get in there till quarter to eight, and they put somebody working with me all the time. And then I become ill again, and um, then, um, so at the time when I first got diagnosed, they said, you've got 10 years to survive it. And I mean, I oh, thought, God. But then I thought it's a long time because um, I can sort things out. And the one thing I wanted to sort out at the time was my father. Uh, I didn't want him to go into a home and all the rest of it. So um, anyway, um, then when the actual sec uh, it come back again in 2001, and I thought, God, I'm an open boy with this, but this is the way it was. Uh, it come back in 2001. I thought that's it, so I went down to St Gregory's Church, sorted out my music and my affairs and everything. So when I went to the consultant again, my consultant moved on to Russell Hall's um, hematologist. So he said, tell me, I said, right, he said, well, we're going to give you a treatment, which is a work a week's treatment, consistent, where they plug into you, the chemo with you. I said, well, I've sorted all my affairs. He said, what do you mean? I said, well, this is it. He said, no, it's not. He said, oh, tell it's on your record. He said, yes, they only gave you 10 years. He said, the new, that's antiquated, the stuff we give you then. The new stuff we're going to give you is going to get you into your old age. Anyway, he must have been about 15 or 16, so I ran at him and I picked him up. But there was a nurse there in the room with her. She started crying. And I swung him round and I was trying to <laughs> hook him and kiss him. He put me down, put me down. I just couldn't believe what, he, what he'd said because I'd convinced myself. I've sorted my music out, this is it. And then I did have it, and as I say, I'm still here to tell the story. So as I say, life has got a way of throwing stuff at you, but you've just got to try and deal with it the best way you can. That's what I found anyway. And I mean, I've had lots of other things since. And you just got to look at that light. I mean, somebody said to me once that, um, you know, when you said you can't see any light at the end of the tour, and sometimes you just got to run down that tunnel and turn that light on yourself, full stop. Um, and no matter who you are, you, none of us know what's around the corner and it affects us, you know, affairs of the hearts or illnesses and you think, why me? You know, I'm not such a bad person, but it doesn't matter what you are, you can cop for it. So you just got to fight and keep pushing forward. And I mean, I must admit, I'm in my 60s now 
and I'm loving life and I love my neighbours, I love everything in my life. I was going swimming until I got a bit of a, I'm not going to go down that road again, but uh, you know, I swim in every morning and it's what you make of it and, and it's what you get out of it. Um, and I says, I'm lucky in the road I live in, all our neighbours get on and it's a pleasure to meet different people in the road and you, it's a game sometimes to get in the house because you're always rattling and talking. Uh, that's what he turned to me because I'm a rattler. But uh, but now it's lovely and as I say, I wouldn't want to live anywhere else really. But the one thing I have kept with me is not to give in, uh, no matter what comes at you, is to try and just keep going forward and, and get on with it. Um, what, what would your message be to anybody young or anybody right now who's going through something Well, that can't see the light at the end of the tunnel, that, well, can't, that feels like this is it, they yeah, don't want I, to you know, go on? And I know, I mean, it's a terrible thing that's going on now with youngsters uh, self-harming and God knows what. But unfortunately, when you're young, you just, all you can see, you haven't had a life experience, you think it will pass. And what's nothing to us, to when you're young, it can be a real, you know, um, nightmare. I mean, I'm getting back to when my father died. I um, I got through that and then I delayed action. Um, and friends of mine noticed that I was not taking care of the house and all that. Anyway, they frogged marching down to the doctors and um, he said, right, he was gonna send me to psychiatric. I said, there's no need for all this, I'm all right. Got me down there and uh, I got the young Asian lad who was the, the um, psychiatric doctor and if I'd have run a pub, I wouldn't have served him. He didn't look old enough to get, have a drink. And the wisdom that came out of him was unbelievable. And he was asking me stuff. Well, what he'd done was first, he said, I'm going to go through a lot of stuff. I might stop and start and uh, move you on or keep you on it. I said, whatever. And uh, he got on to my father. He'd done my job first, my illnesses. And I talked through it. Um, then he got on to my father. And I, straight away, you know, when your lip starts going, and he said, oh, and I said, I can't, I can't talk. And he threw some tissues. He said, no, you can. He said, well, keep on now until you can talk about it about, and laugh and joke about the good times. And the point I get to is that I went into the, um, there was a waiting room and there's magazines and that. And the, your name was called on a tenoy. <coughs> and, uh, you know, room three, Mr. Riley come through. Anyway, a woman come in with a young girl. She must have been a, a carer for her. And uh, she looked at me and says, have you come about your hair, son? And this girl nearly died to death. I said, I don't want you Because I mean, I could have been there, you know, worrying about not having no hair. I says, no, no, no. I says, you ain't a bad looking bloke. I said, but if you had some hair, you'd look a lot better. <laughs> this girl said, oh, I'm so sorry. I said, don't worry about it. And then it started on me then. It says, have you got your own hair? I said, I have actually. I threw them on a winner a winner in there like that. I said, do you grow your own vegetables? I said, no. I says, you don't, you could, potatoes, run, runner beans. And this girl kept saying, please leave the man alone. <laughs> anyway, eventually I got away from her. So when I got into my man, who was looking at a young Asian lad psychiatrist, I was laughing. He says, what's me, I told him the story. He said, he said, I think my work's done with you now. He said, well, will you just promise me one thing? If it got low again, I mean, I didn't get low to top myself, but uh, I was, you know, you just had a bit like, um, he said, would you come back? I said, I would. I said, I'll be honest, when I first come in, I said, I don't think he was old enough to get served in the pub. And one of the things he said to me was, when somebody, when you get in the shops and somebody meets you, he said, and you say, how are you doing? Like, you know, he said, what do you say? I said, oh, I mustn't grumble a lot. He said, we all hold it in. He said, if everybody was to give a true drug, he said, you'd never ask another person to get how they are. Yeah. I said, what do you mean? He said, they'd keep you there for an hour. It's because we've all got it in there, but we've all said, no, I'm great, I'm doing great. He said, but you'd never ask another person again. He said, and I'm going to try and get it out of you now. What? I said, I don't know what the problem is. And that's it, like, it's, it, that's the way it runs. So as I say, to youngsters, I say, it will pass. And whatever it is at the moment will feel bad, but it will come good eventually. So just hang in there. And the things that, when you're young, like, I mean, a spot on your nose or pimples on your face can seem like the end of the world, but it's not. It's just a phase you go through then eventually it comes good and you'll look back yourself and think, God, what was that all about? But I mean, it is sad that youngsters can take the life, the lives of a, a love affair that's gone wrong or somebody that didn't like them. And it does go on in their self-harm and all that. But it's the pressures, I mean, I suppose the pressure was there when we were younger, but the youngsters seem to be under a lot more pressure now with buying houses and got to look, you know, 
on trend and having money for that and they can't get jobs where we could walk into jobs they can't now so as I say hang in there and just keep kicking and fighting that's all I can say and that light down at the end of the tunnel go down and switch it on yourself and if you want somebody to help you look in the mirror you're the one nobody else well, <laughs> no. well, it was, uh, nice talking to you all right. and uh, don't go anywhere because once I find myself a woman you know I need you to be at my wedding oh, you know, right I'll be for me together, you know, <laughs> but, um, I'll be for me I'll be for me okay sir and, thank uh, you very I'll much you thank Bye. you Welcome to me, man cave. That's where it started out. I've been sending it up for Christmas tree. This is what happens when you retire. You keep adding bits of, bits of light in, bits of light there, blow there. But there you go. Light, low, light, low flying aircraft try to land sometimes. And then come in aircraft, but it's what you do when you retire. You start messing. You know, there's too many lights. There's barely lights all around it. And at night time, it looks really good. All right, I'll see you then, campers. Bye now. Right, so I'm Aaron from Autofit Birmingham. You're more than welcome to follow me and see what I've been up to on Instagram. You can follow us on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter. If there's anything you'd like to ask me or anything you'd like me to do. We are going back to car reviews after this, but I just thought, you know, I've got a platform and even though I took a lot of criticism for, do, for wanting to do this video, this is just my way of trying to give back to my community. If one person likes it to me, then I've succeeded. If one person can change their life, Everybody in this video, everybody that shares it, likes it, they've succeeded. Um, everyone take care. I'm Aaron from Autofit Birmingham. We bring the garage to you.